97.3 ESPN presents the Sports Bash with Mike Gill. It's time for Football at Four with Jeff Mosier, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. I love coaching this football team. I love coaching those players in there. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. It is Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, which dropped this morning at 6 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 6 a.m. Get the Inside the Birds podcast. It's brought to you locally by PlaySugarHouse.com. Sign up now. They'll match your first deposit up to $250. Go to PlaySugarHouse.com and win real money with their sports book along with casino games from the comfort of your home. Must be 21 or older to play. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Jeff Mosher from InsideTheBirds.com and the Inside the Birds podcast is here. We have a lot to dive into as the Eagles get ready for the Baltimore Ravens. Doug Peterson speaking today as we uh, look ahead to that. A couple things to get on from the game against the Steelers. Let's bring Jeff Mosher in now, get his thoughts on uh, what he hears uh, and what you know, because Jim Schwartz danced around that question about what happened on that play. Peterson didn't really want to discuss it. McLeod said stuff. I mean, I don't know that anybody got a chance to talk to Geary, but what is uh, ultimately, what do you think failed on that play? Well, I, I, I do like to be fair. Sometimes uh, they're there. And, and look, we never do this when the Eagles strike a big play. We never say, um, man, they had the perfect call for that defense. And, and they, the Steelers really did. They had Claypool in the slot against a, in a spread formation against a cover two look. So McLeod, the safety there, uh, there's three receivers to the left side. So McLeod, as the safety comes over, he's got to play that middle receiver more because if that middle receiver just runs a straight vertical route, then he's going to be wide open. So McLeod's got to be over there. And that leaves Gary uh, alone there against the, because they're, they're in that cover cover look uh, that leaves Gary in the same range or realm of where uh, Claypool is going to be. And Jim, what we learned from Jim, that's what you asked. What did we learn? Uh, Jim felt like, that he shouldn't have been a great, he, he wanted to keep them from not getting the field goal, right? That's why Gary was up there. He didn't want to give up more yards and give them a field goal. And then that enabled Claypool then to see that kind of cushion, put a double move on and get wide open. Because some people are saying, well, why aren't you having Gary back more? Why is Gary up on the receiver like that, who he can't keep up with. And Jim says, well, if I play him all the way back and have him take even bigger depth, then he gives up underneath and, and they keep the clock going and then they get the field goal. So that was Jim's mentality. I guess what we can look from that is, is we can talk about, well, why did you have to be in, in that defense? You could have been another one, but if they were in man defense, you probably would have had a similar type of matchup. Right. And, and that's where it comes back down to, personnel and Nate Gary the stats are what the stats are the quarterbacks I believe are 23 of 23 when targeting Nate Gary this year which is an a try that's unbelievable it's like yeah. the, a quarterback didn't even accidentally throw an interception no. just by happenstance or just not complete the pass it's amazing that every single pass target at Nate Gary this year has been completed for positive yards uh and that's where we're at. I mean, you're, you're, it becomes personnel. Okay. So I'm glad you brought this up because at what point is that demoralizing to the other guys in the room? Like, this guy is <laughs> 23 of 23. You know, he's out of place. Teams are obviously picking on him. They're obviously game planning for him. What do I have to do to get on the field? You know, like, doesn't that kind of bring down the morale of the other players in that room who are not getting an opportunity when this guy is constantly getting questioned and he's got to be getting on tape every week in that room going, all right, you were wrong here. Oh, you messed up here. Yeah. I mean, by the way, the real question is how demoralizing is it for Nate Gary to look at the stat sheet and know that he's had 23 <laughs> passes completed on him in 23 <laughs> attempts. That can't be great for his own morale either. But I mean, I, Mike, I think what you're asking though is more of a characterization of the linebacker group altogether. If there was somebody that was better or somebody who was more accomplished, I'm sure the coaches would play him. Now I, I don't want to dismiss the idea that somebody else couldn't do a better job. Maybe Sean Bradley, maybe Davion Taylor, but the, the reason why Sean Bradley has played the, uh, the small amount of snaps 
is he's a very late round pick. He's not a super athlete. He's a smart, instinctive linebacker, but I think you've seen him in there more so to play the run because he's better in that uh, part of the game than the pass. And then, of, and, and Davion, so Davion Taylor is an interesting conversation because this is a guy who is all traded up, right? And he's got tremendous speed. So maybe, and I've seen some of his college tape, maybe in this case, he gets beat by Claypool right at the, uh, at the initial double move, but has the closing speed to kind of get back there and break up that pass. So maybe in that one instance, Davion Taylor's athletic traits serve him better than Nate Gary. But that, uh, that's just an assumption that athletic traits is going to change what you're seeing uh, is the problem with the linebacker position. As I said on the podcast, just because you have speed and just because you have traits doesn't make you a good football player or a smart football player um, or uh, a, a fundamentally sound or a technically sound football player. And we know that those were the issues with Davion Taylor coming out of college. He just doesn't have a whole lot of experience. So he may make a play for you in one area, but he might give up three or four other plays that are going to be, you know, debilitating for you. You can argue that that 23 for 23 is worse than what we saw from Brandon Workman this year in the Phillies uniform. No, I mean, that's crazy. But, no, I, look, I, I wanted to go in the same direction when you started mentioning all these other guys. You know, at some point, Fulgham was a nobody, and if you told me in week one that Fulgham was going to play, I'd be like, oh, yeah, because that's going to work. And then he ends up being who he is right now, which is keeping us intrigued. I just feel you see the numbers. You mentioned the numbers with Nate Gary. You got to try something new. Whether it works or not, we, we'll wait and see. But as of right now, this is not working. You need to try something else. This reminds me a little bit, Hunter, though, of the conversations in years past where the front four rush isn't working, right? You got to blitz. You got to blitz. And then you look, go look at the numbers last year of Jim Schwartz blitzing, and it's like they were the worst – blitzing team in the league as far as their ability to stop quarterbacks quarterbacks had last year. I remember had a, had a phenomenal QB rating against the blitz last year. And then that's more because not because of, of just their blitzing, but you know, does the quarterback know where the blitz is coming from? I mean, are, does Jim mix it up? So to get back to the personnel. Yeah. Like I said, maybe there's a chance that you can put somebody in there who gets like two or three more stops than Nate Gary, but that's also making it seem like Nate Gary is the only reason the Eagles gave up 38 points uh, in that, or that Claypool touchdown was the, 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 the game winning touchdown when it was not, there were all sorts of issues on third down in that game. I mean, Slay had two bit, two penalties, one bad one, one I didn't think was on him. Uh, Jalen Mills got beat for a 31 yard touchdown and then had another one taken back on him, which might've been a phantom. So you can, you can, uh, what's they say? You can rearrange the furniture on the Titanic mm -hmm. uh, if you want, Hunter, but there, it doesn't address all of the issues. It doesn't address the big hole in the boat. I, I would agree that, that, that he's not the only problem, but would you agree with this? If I'm Greg Roman this week, and if I'm, you know, coordinating an offense against the Eagles, they're sitting in that room and they're saying, where's 47? Yes, I agree. He's got the red circle around him. There's no doubt about it. And... You know, again, though, just if they had, if putting Sean Bradley in or putting Davion Taylor in, if that made a huge difference enough to that to stop the bleeding, I would advocate for it. And maybe it would. And maybe they will. We'll have to go and see because sometimes they have done these, they've made changes. Maybe Alex Singleton. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember the play I tweeted out earlier. Ben, ben Roethlisberger avoided like a sack three times, rolled to his right, threw to his left in Pat Mahomes fashion. And somehow Eric Ebron makes this like falling behind the shoulder catch on that pass for 17 yards. And Alex Singleton was right there with Ebron the whole way. The, 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 Ebron catching it was not because Singleton played poor defense. It was just one of those, the quarterback makes an amazing play, the tight end makes an amazing play. So maybe Singleton is a guy who becomes your dime linebacker or when you're in that kind of cover look that they gave uh, – for Claypool there, he's your low line. Yeah, hey, I'll tell you what, but in the limited snaps. Eventually, the red single, red, eventually, Mike, the red circle goes around Alex Singleton. Possibly, team, you know? but in the in the limited snaps that he's had, I feel like he has the instincts at least to make a play. He covered, got an interception. I saw him make a couple of tackles in the San Francisco. He had 15 plays. He made two tackles at an interception. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say, look. Guess what, Gary? Sorry, I'm going to give this guy an opportunity. Let's see what he has. He can't be any worse than you. Let's see what he has. 
You know, and maybe you'll see that on Sunday. And then if that may, you know, a lot of games are one or two possession games, right? So and to, to go back to your point, that game against the 49ers was a very close game. And Alex Singleton getting that interception and taking it back, even though it was thrown to him, uh, wound up being the difference in the game. And so maybe that's the case. You know, I have a feeling on Sunday against Baltimore, you're going to need a little bit more than, than one good play from a linebacker. Uh, and we'll see what happens. But th- there's a, there's a, there's definitely some merit to what you're saying. I just don't know that it has the widespread impact that you would want a promotion or a demotion to to reap for your team. Um, I just think it's more of an illustration again about the difference between devaluing linebacker and destroying it altogether. At the, at the beginning of last year, the Eagles weren't great at linebacker, but their two main linebackers or Camus Grugier-Hill and Nigel Bradham. And while none of those guys are winning any All-Pros or Pro Bowl awards, they're competent linebackers, or at least they were last year. We know Nigel was on the decline. I think Camus was playing for the Dolphins. They they were just better altogether than what you're putting out now, and they just really never did anything after Jatavis Brown decided to retire to give themselves some help there. You mentioned the word impact, and I'm trying to think, okay, well, how can we make this team better? Who can impact it? Will Parks, what's the status on him and how much of an impact can he make? Yeah, I mean, he's been activated from the 21-day window. He's going to be at practice. We'll see. The weird thing is when you're in that 21-day window, they don't necessarily have to put on the injury report what you're doing. For example, Vinny Curry was not on the injury report at all last week because he wasn't technically on the, on the I guess, the 53. He's in that activation window. So without the benefit of watching practice or seeing the injury report, we may not even know if he's full, if he's limited, or what he's doing. Even if he's doing something, I mean, I think it's kind of unfair to expect after seven weeks, after seven weeks, that he's going to just step in there and be able to, you know, play twenty to thirty snaps a game. So I, I'm, I think this is not the week where you think Will Parks can help be your savior. Maybe uh, the week after when they play the Cowboys, you get to see a little bit more. What are you playing Jenga? No, it's my my daughter. She's uh, playing with a um, a little car, you know, rolling it around. Oh, all right. Thought maybe uh, you pulled out the piece of wood and the whole thing came crashing down. Something like no, that. No, but that that would be a nice microcosm for the day I'm having. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Jeff Mosher, Football Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. I want to get your take. Then uh, we know that that position is a big problem. Uh, your take on Fulgham. Everybody seems to have an opinion on whether he can play or not. Is he a part of their offense regardless? Because the way I see it is if they get Jackson and Jeffrey and Rieger and Goddard back, that leaves snaps out for somebody, man. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I say the same thing with Jeffrey, who's barely been able to practice, right? He was supposed to practice last week, then he had the, the foot, then it, was, then it was he was sick, then it was he was sick and a foot. I mean, he's going to get out there and practice this week, but he's no way near 100%. And if Deshaun can play – which you would like to think he could, then at least you can stick him at the other end at the Z and have Fulgham be your X. There's no way they're pulling Travis Fulgham off the field. Just like I told you guys last week, even with J.J. Arthago Whiteside back, there's no way that Fulgham is not going to get the opportunity to make plays, even with Alshon back. That's, it's just not going to happen. This has got a young player who's earned the confidence of the quarterback. He's healthy. He's got nice size. He runs well. Apparently the scouting staff um, liked him coming out of college, so they had some – background information on him uh, there's just they're not going to like just relegate him to the bench all of a sudden because Alshon is back and can play a little bit this is a kid who's could factor into their future plans yeah speaking of the offense with Carson Wentz this kind of ties together everything because I thought the offensive line it wasn't a big help with the run game but that ties together with Carson Wentz I feel with him and Fulgham being able to move the football down a couple touchdowns they were able to go on drives and I feel that you know, being so one-dimensional at that point in the game, because Sanders didn't get much going other than that one touchdown, how impressed were you with Carson Wentz? And you can throw Fulgham in the mix as well, but specifically Carson Wentz being so one-dimensional, being able to move the football. Uh, I was really impressed. There was a – watching the tape the last two days, there was a drive. I think it was their third possession where Carson targeted Fulgham, I think, on six straight plays. So yeah. that just shows you the type of uh, – confidence that he had in him and I think four or five of them were catches the other one wasn't his fault it might have just been uh, a throwaway because of pressure but he clearly likes the kid the kid the kid runs his routes really well and Carson 
doesn't have to worry per se about, oh, he's got to be open. He can throw it to him in, in uh, contested catch situations, and he knows where in the zone that Fulgham can run and, and kind of sit down and make a play. He had a nice reception on the ro- along the right sideline. I think it was on a, a long third down where he just, you know, ran his pattern and ran to the out and sat down between the safety and made a quick run and made the catch. So I- I'm impressed with both of them. I think that there were even a couple of plays that we saw that uh, Fulton was open and Carson didn't see him. So it's amazing to think, but uh, he had 153 yards. It could have been even more if Carson had seen him on there. So it- I like the way the, the offense – in that regard, evolved, guys. But I do think that one thing we learned about the Steelers uh, is that while they have a tremendous front seven, their cornerbacks aren't that great. Hayden had a bad game, um, gave up a lot of yards and some cushion, even when the Steelers were getting pressure. When you talk about the Ravens, you're talking about a different kind of animal. They, they may not have the caliber of pass rusher as, say, Dupree and Watt, but they're a more stout front seven. I mean, they really can overpower you up front. And their corners are legit. Marlon Humphrey, who the Eagles – I believe, passed on when they took uh, Derek Barnett. Marlon Humphrey has been an excellent cornerback, and I don't think that those wide-open lanes for Fulgham uh, are going to be as as prominent this weekend. So it's uh, to, to think that he can do another 10 for 153 against that defense is not not fair and shouldn't be expected. But that means, as you just mentioned, whether it's Miles Sanders or somebody, somebody else is going to have to step up and make some plays. Uh, Jeff Mosher, Inside the Birds podcast. Uh, don't forget the Inside the Birds pregame show. Trey Thomas is a part of that show. I'm interested to, uh, if you've got a chance to talk to Trey and, and, and you know what he's thought about Mayalata and whether or not Mayalata has a shot to stick there and what happens to Peters once my uh, you know if they like Mayalata, why would you take him out at this point? Yeah, no, we've we've talked about Mayalata. Um, he did a nice little breakdown on his uh, YouTube channel again of the of the offensive line yesterday. There are some things that are, are concerning, obviously, with Mayalata because he's still very raw. Uh, one of the things is that he tends to um, let the the pass rusher get his hands on his on Mayalata's chest before Mayalata can punch. Uh, it's called the double underhanded hooks, and you'll you'll see that um, some instances where a big man who's 350 pounds is still being driven back by the pass rusher because he's allowed the rusher's hands to get into his chest while he's taking a vertical set. So using the momentum against him right up into the quarterback. But aside from that, he is holding his own very well. And I do think you have to keep giving him the opportunity to grow. And so when JP comes back, you know, the one guy who stood out who's just not playing well is Matt Pryor. Um, He's just, you know, you saw Miles Sanders not do well. And much out of the there weren't a whole lot of lanes, and a lot of that was just Matt Pryor is not moving anybody back. So you, you're wondering, this is just something that Adam and I speculated in the podcast that dropped this morning. Would you consider just keeping my a lot of their tackle and then putting Jason Peters right. back at right guard where you were originally intended to one play? It's a lot of money for a right guard. He really played that pretty well. Uh, Jeff Mosher, <laughs> the Inside the Birds podcast. We'll leave with this. Carson Wentz, uh, 57% completed passes. Does that tell the story, though, of how well or maybe he didn't play well? What did you think on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's still a mixed bag with Carson. I know the the, the 29 points looks good, and it feels like the offense is rolling and it's doing a little bit better week by week. You know, we had Ron Jaworski on uh, Inside the Birds TV yesterday. It's, it's up on our YouTube channel now. And he said – Look, Carson's playing better in the rhythm offense that started in San Francisco has clearly helped him, but he's still sailing passes. For whatever reason, his connection with Zach Ertz is just off right now. And a lot of people are down on Zach Ertz, but you have to realize a lot of these throws, he's throwing Ertz off hot. For whatever reason, he's he's skying them and sailing them. Even to Fulgham. Fulgham had to jump up and catch a few of them. He just happens to have that kind of tight and athleticism to be able to do that. Um, he's got to, they definitely have to get back on track with Ertz. And then there's still this issue of not seeing the entire field clearly. There were about four or five spots during the game and watching tape that I noticed that there was an open receiver and Carson just for whatever reason did not want to pull the trigger. And it's not like it was a, a scrub player either. Yeah, there, you know, guys were out there playing. So um, I, 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 I'm not fully back. I think that, that completion percentage shows you that he's. In, He's still got some work to do before he's kind of like a Carson that can single-handedly win games. Real quick, uh, do you think they will consider and should they consider moving Ertz if uh, there's a deal to be made? 
That's a good question. I guess that so the deadline is what November third, I think, yeah, and coming up. Yeah. So how many? So how many games between the, now and that? It's like four games, I believe. Uh, yeah, you have one, two, three games. You got two, one Ravens, oh, Giants, Cowboys. All right. So let's say let's say they lose to the Ravens. Because you have a you have a buy in there. Yeah, but win one of two against the Cowboys and Giants. They're, they're gonna be in it. You know what I'm saying? Like they're. They must have, I guess, lose every single game between now and the deadline, I would think. And even then, they still might be in it. But then you're looking at, a, what, you're, you're like 1-6-1 and one or 1-7-1, one, and one, and you're thinking it doesn't even matter if we make the playoffs with five or six or seven wins. We're just not good, and we need to start thinking about the future. Then maybe that, that conversation comes up. But, you know, if they can win two games somehow over the next few weeks, then – you're, you're, you're sta- a little bit more stable. You're closer to 500. And I don't see them having a fire sale and getting rid of a guy if they feel like they can build on something. All right, Jeff Mosher, Inside the Birds podcast. Make sure you check it out. It drops this morning. The new one will drop on Friday morning and the Inside the Birds pregame show. And, of course, every day, football at four right here tomorrow. Adam Kaplan is here. Jeff will be back on Friday as uh, we get you ready for Eagles and the Ravens. All right, Jeff, man. Take care, bud. All right, back to my Jenga game. Take care, guys. <laughs> he, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline.